Hi, thanks for uh, coming to CSIS today. We're delighted you're all here. My name is Murray Hebert. I work on Southeast Asia here at CSIS. It's a delight to uh, uh, welcome our guest, Serge Pun, who is the uh, head of Serge Pun Associates, founder, company founded in 1983. Uh, it's a now a very diversified conglomerate in, in uh, Myanmar. It's involved in real estate, banking, healthcare, uh, aviation, recently got involved in aviation. Uh, and, but Serge uh, was born in Myanmar, but he's got a really interesting uh, history in 65. Uh, people of his ethnicity, you can probably tell from his family name, he's ethnic Chinese. They were all mostly expelled from from Burma back in the day and uh, went back to, to China. Had, if you arrived back in China in 1965, you can tell, it's a, you probably know that was a rather unusual time. So Serge has some, some interesting experiences back then in 80, finally in 83, actually late 70s you got out, right? 73. 73. And then uh, was involved in real estate in Hong Kong and China and then eventually set up SPA, which is now listed in Singapore, if I remember correctly. Not SPA, but another company called Yoma. Oh, Yoma is okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, Serge, we're delighted you're here. Why don't you, if if you're up for it, give us a, some a brief overview of how you see things in in Myanmar these days, in light of the reforms, the upcoming elections, relations with neighbors, uh, including if you want to talk about the United States, and then we'll have lots of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Murray. Well, thank you for inviting me to this event. And I'm not sure if any of you will get anything out of this one hour. But um, you will at least get probably a, an honest perspective of how a business person views what's happening in Myanmar today. Uh, and that's about all I can say about um, what we're going to talk about. Uh, I do not represent any party. I'm not in any politics, um, nor am I interested in. But the years in China has probably um, compelled me to be a little more sensitive to political developments in any given country, because politics always affect economics and how we do business. And for that reason, I've been rather uh, interested to see how uh, our political scene in Myanmar has developed, particularly over the last four years of the um, new administration under what we call a nascent democracy. Uh, today, uh, four years uh, into the new administration, I think the hot topic is none other than the elections that are coming towards the end of the year. and. There's been a lot of speculation as to what's going to happen. I think there are two things that are probably uh, meaningful and significant. Uh, one thing, well, the first is that I believe that the election will be free and fair, clean. Uh, this belief is based on what I know of the administration's desire of the military's desire and their commitment to invite uh, publicly uh, people like the Carter Center, the EU, and various other governments, including the UN, to come in as observers uh, for this year's election. I think that's a very uh, important uh, step for the government to ensure that everything is clean. I also think that it's a very smart move because the legitimacy of whoever has been elected um, at this moment seems to be hanging on, on one particular party's endorsement. And to be honest, it's whether NLD endorses the election. And there is such a great threat that if NLC is not, NLD is not happy, then it might render this election to be like less or even not legitimate. The invitation or, uh, to the Carter Center as well as the EU governments and the UN 
and any other government that cares to come and observe through their embassies and ambassadors, I think it's a very um, rational and smart move to finally give legitimacy as to whether the election was clean, fair, and free. So that's the first thing I think was good. The second thing is that today, I think the minorities are having a bigger say. And with the signing of the draft, draft peace accord on the 31st of March, uh, it has given a new impetus and a new uh, perspective to what is going to happen. We know that peace can never be assured unless we have the minorities all on side under a federalist uh, government. We also know that peace cannot be assured and will not be stable unless we have the strong support of a military. Um, the support of the military is an interesting subject that a lot of people have been talking about. And I personally, for one, think that in the last four years, the military has behaved very well. Um, I have not seen any evidence of the military you know, trying to throw their weight around, influence political decisions, or do things that are probably not uh, or against the democratic principles of the society. So to, in that, to that effect, I think the military has behaved extremely well. And it, is, uh, it would be a folly to think that we could have a very stable society, particularly in the early days of a democratic sort of transition, without a stabilizing force. And that stabilizing force in Myanmar, in my mind, is one and singular and that's the military. With that, we can perhaps ensure a stable transition to democracy. Without that, I think the chances of chaos and uh, infighting uh, would probably derail any democratic attempts, uh, however noble and however uh, good the intentions are. So that's my view. It may not be correct, um, and I think what would be more interesting is perhaps we have a dialogue today to uh, sort of um, exchange views. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. And then we can have a little debate if we want. OK, Murray? Sure. Are there questions? Um, or should I? Uh, maybe I'll ask a question and give you guys a little chance to, uh, to prime your, your thinking. Um, can you just also talk about what's the atmosphere like for a businessman in Myanmar today? Uh, there have been some reforms in the banking sector and, and, and foreign exchange, but the, it seems like a lot of the reforms are more on the political side than the economic side. So what's it like? Well, it is true that in the first 20 months of the administration, there was virtually no economic reforms. Everything was focused on political and social reform, which, in my opinion, differentiates Myanmar to all other emerging markets in the last two to three decades. Um, if, you look at, if you look back, the first major legislation that our parliament passed was the uh, labor law. Um, a labor law is typically a kind of law that emerging markets don't want to touch for about 25 years and only talk about labor protection and minimum pay after they have achieved some degree of economic prosperity. But our government chose to, or this government chose to, take labor law as the first major law to be passed in this new parliament. And the law was highly acclaimed by ILO. And you know, quite funny and, and ironically, I mean, we had 250 strikes and demonstrations in the first year or uh, strikes that never happened before. And some of them, when they arrived at the office of ILO, became sort of a joke, because uh, there were workers who would go and say, we have not been given lunch. So the ILO chief would say, are you on strike? Say, yes, we're on strike. Well, if you're on strike, you won't get lunch, of course. <laughs> and they would say, oh, well, we thought lunch is lunch and strike is strike, you see. We want to strike, and we want our lunch, too. So. 
things of that nature happened, but it's a good sign. The second major law was the land reform, where farmers were given land titles to um, farmlands that they have been cultivating for decades without any entitlement. And then we had the freedom of press law. Right? All these were major social reforms. The Foreign Investment Act actually only happened in November of 2012, a good you know, 20 months into the administration. Right? So I would say, yes, uh, economic reform was not very high in a uh, priority. But since November of 2012, it has become a major, um, a major focus of the government. And as a businessman, all I can say is that before, before the commencement of this government, it was very difficult unless you are part of, well, to be blunt, unless you're a crony. It was cronyism running amok. It was the way of life. So you either be part of the, the game, and then you're OK. If you choose not to be, then you're not OK. Today, President Thay Singh's major, major uh, um, policy is that we have to level the playing field. He abolished all the um, monopolies held by the various interest groups for imports. He um, basically said, Everything has got to be transparent, go for tender. And that's why I think we had some prosperity and economic progress. Today, everybody has a chance. If anything, I think my friends who are being branded as cronies are having a tough time because uh, they couldn't get a, a fair hearing. Hi. Uh, Thomas Yandel, I'm a consultant, but I've also been a political economist in academia, and I studied Vietnam for the last almost 20 years. So comparative question. Two questions, actually, very connected. Uh, one thing that I always wondered about Vietnam is not why do investors go there today, but why did the first investors go there, given all the problems that you describe now for Myanmar that exist, exist in Vietnam, too. So my first question is, other than that you're born there, why did you make the jump? And the second question, Related, I wrote a book about this for Vietnam, and I wonder uh, how it works in, in Myanmar. Uh, one of the things that investors want to see is this, uh, the, the self-limitation by elites, right? Reduced predation, uh, credible business climate. What's Myanmar doing uh, to create or to portray that credible business climate in the long run that make people like you and many others at some point ideally come and stay? To start with, I went back for the first time in 1970, 1970 uh, sorry, 89. If you recall, the uh, Nguyen government um, stepped down in 1988, and uh, a transitional government was, uh, the SLOC was formed. <laughs> and in 1989, they announced that people like us were for the first time permitted to return to Myanmar. Uh, before that, you were just not granted a visa. So having been away for 26 years, I went back out of curiosity to see what has happened. I had, to be honest, no intention to start a business there. I was just a tourist. But it was fate that arranged that, uh, a meeting on that trip for me to meet a general by the name of David Abel. David Abel was the only Christian in the cabinet of Slog. He was also the only uh, Sandhurst uh, officer who retained his name as David Abel and didn't change it into a Burmese name. He was also the minister of three portfolios, minister of finance, minister of trade, and minister of national planning. And David did a fantastic sales job on me. He played to my roots, and, and he basically said, you need to come back to help, invest, do something. That was what we call the first spring. Actually, most people in the world only know Myanmar today as being opened up. Myanmar actually opened up the first time in 1990, 
with the promulgation of the Foreign Investment Act in 1990. That was when we could go back, set up companies, get all the tax breaks and so forth, and you could actually own your business and be guaranteed it will not be nationalized. And those were the years when David Abel was Minister of Finance and Minister of Trade, and as well as Minister of National Planning. The second thing was that I actually walked the streets where I grew up, went back to my old school, and felt extremely sorry to see the state it was in. So make a long story short, I said, OK, I will come back and invest. And so we started a small company with seven people. 10 years later, it was 4,500 staff, and it has grown to about 40 companies. Most of it, organic growth. It wasn't designed that way. Uh, organic growth, I'll give you an example. I built a real estate project, which was a gated community. We had about 50 security guards manning our community. The next thing I know is the chap next door says, you seem to be doing a good job. Can you come and do security for my factory? And this just sort of multiplied. And before you know, we were doing security for embassies, for corporations, and we had 850 security staff on our payroll. So it became a security company instead of just a, a division. And a lot of our companies was like that. There was such a need for services that whatever we started for our own self became a company and it had 80% third party contracts. So that was the first spring. And then the whole thing came to a halt in 2003 when we had our financial crisis, what I call a self-inflicted financial crisis. And we didn't recover from that. Coupled with the sanctions that came in towards the, the end of the century and um, sort of escalated all through 2001, 2002, 2003, we had a tough time. And that's when actually cronyism, corruption, when blatant. And that is the history of the recent 20 years. Now we have a new government. In fact, the, two, the thing to compare with Vietnam, which is very, very obvious and evident for businessmen, is that Vietnam is a place where it's so easy to get in. They welcome you with open arms, and it's very easy to start a business. It's after you get in that your troubles start. <laughs> Myanmar is just the reverse. It's so difficult, seemingly, to get in. The bureaucracy, getting the permits, getting the approvals from one department to another it takes months. But I have never experienced any foreign investor who have come in, established, and want to leave. They're happy. The workers are good. You know, the government bent backwards to help you. So that's the different, the different situation with the two countries. And uh, if you're talking about um, the, ra um, the, the, the recent survey of Myanmar being still at the bottom of, of uh, the list of survey of if, you, if this country was friendly to business and so forth, I mean, we'll rank very low. I personally don't agree with it because I also know Vietnam well enough. The corruption in our, in our country today, at least, has, it's not as blatant anymore as it used to be. Because our president is a very clean president. And he's got a very clear policy that he wants anti-graft, anti-corruption, level playing field to be the center of the core of his policies. And he practices it. The people around him, in a circle, are clean, patriotic. I can say that for all the ministries. And there is still a lot of undercurrent. But I don't think that's the situation in Vietnam. Okay. So I don't know how these institutions does their rating and so forth. But we always get to the very bottom of the ranking. Okay. We're just as happy. Steve. I hope I've answered your question. 
Sorry, we got a bunch of hands here, but it's <coughs> this one, and then we'll go to the back and we'll come back here. Uh, thanks. I'm Steve Hirsch. I'm a journalist. Uh, let me ask two very simple but obvious questions about the political situation. One is you talked about the election. Uh, is the key to its acceptance as being free and fair, as many people here think, whether Aung San Suu Kyi participates? My second question is, what do you think the prospects are that the current uh, consultations will result in an actual ceasefire? Thanks. I'm sorry, I need, uh, I didn't hear your first question clearly. Can you? Is, is Aung San Suu Kyi the key to whether the elections are accepted as free and fair? Whether, she, whether she's allowed to run for president? Well, the Constitution today says very clearly that she is not eligible to be president. It doesn't mean that her party cannot win. It doesn't mean that her party, if it wins more than 51% of the seats in the parliament, cannot rule the country. We have a system where it's actually the elections for the parliament. And only after the parliament election is over, the, the parliament actually, the two houses, nominates three candidates to be president. And if you have more seats, your candidate is going to be president for sure. Right? So I don't think uh, it's fair to say, well, the trouble here is that is Aung San Suu Kyi's presidency equal to democracy? And is her not being president equal to no democracy? Any conclusion of that sort, I think, is too simplistic. Right? For instance, we still have an issue about whether or not she will boycott the elections, which she had said untimed times. I hope she does not. Because if she does, chances are that the election will continue, will go on as planned. And it'll be a tough time for her to fight back into the system to do whatever she's so good at doing, being the conscious of our nation, you know. But if she doesn't join, then there is no fight, okay? You can say whatever you like outside of government, outside of parliament, it won't mean anything. You have to be in there, inside, to make the reforms. And in the last four years, I think that she has done a great deal to contribute to the reform of this country, and I hope she continues to. The only missing piece is that clause about who is eligible to be president and who's not. And that part, I think, will need time to be solved. I mean, I, I, I've said this before, which may not be totally irrelevant, irrelevant. I said, if there is one Superman in America that everybody believes can take America to extraordinary heights, but he was not born in America, he will not be American president. That's the Constitution. What can you do about it? The only difference is that that Constitution was not directed at one person, whereas ours in 2008 seemed to be directed at one person. That's the only difference. But every country, every Constitution will have some clause, right? How we address that, I think, is, should be the aftermath of the election and not a precondition to this election. See, just a second question. Ceasefire, I, I'm, I'm very happy that it happened on the last day. 31st of March was an imaginary date that if it didn't happen, it probably never happened. And they worked very hard, all sides worked day and night. Finally, on the 31st of March, they signed it. Now, they've got a few more months to work to get to the real agreement. But um, while some Western and analyst media sort of dismiss the importance of that draft agreement, I think that, that that is unfair. Getting that draft agreement signed in itself is monumental. They have tried so many years to get there. And finally, they got there on the last day. It gives us hope that over the next few months that we will be able to really go into an agreement, a peace, fire, a peace agreement, a peace accord, not only just a ceasefire. Because everybody now realizes that it's a lose-lose situation going forward if we don't have peace. It just is not tenable. We have to get there. 
under a federalism uh, system or some system that is acceptable by all parties. Otherwise, it's a dead road. So I'm optimistic. Back there in the middle, red tie. <coughs> Yeah, thank you. I have a couple of questions. The first one is on federalism. You said that probably we're going to go towards the direction. I think that it would be a huge step, of course, if it happens. From what I understand, President Tainsen was not closed on it, but many others are still uh, reluctant. Do you think, is, is it realistic to imagine such a, a path? And the second one is more on the economic side. You mentioned that foreign investors usually enjoy being there. Which are the sectors in which you think uh, for a foreign investor would be more interesting to be now in Myanmar? Thank you. Is the first question about federalism? Yeah. Is it possible? I think it's not only possible, it is the consensus today. There was a lot of debate up on the definition of federalism, and that was mainly the reason of disagreement and some dismissing federalism. As discussions progress, I think there seems to be now a consensus of what federalism is uh, applicable to Myanmar. And it is very much along the lines of the Panlong Agreement, basically, of how the Union of Burma originally got started. Right? And in essence, it's how the economic benefits of each region is equitably distributed to those regions. Right? Uh, and this is more prevalent and prominent today, uh, uh, more than in 1947, because we really see economic benefits being not equitably distributed. Okay? So that, I think, will come to a conclusion that federalism is the best way, where everybody is happy in a big family. The second question, which are the industries? Honestly, every industry is good. We are in such a low stage of economic development that you can pick and choose anyone you want. You will still be OK, and it will have a, a good prospect. Okay? Some are lower hanging fruits. Some are a little more difficult. And it depends on, basically, the investor. For very long-term investors, I think infrastructure projects are the, the ones to really focus on, where you are actually looking at very long uh, payback periods but very steady. And that is the areas where the country need most FDI, most investments. Right. Sir. Thanks. Um, I'm James McNaughton, and I'm in the private equity uh, business. If 40 some years ago I was a junior economist in Bangkok when the Bangkok Stock Exchange, the Securities Exchange of Thailand, started, and since then it's grown tremendously, um, very successfully. And the main participants in it when it was starting were Chinese Thai, the Sino-Thai entrepreneurs, otherwise known as cronies back in those days. And they were friends of the Thai generals and, and so forth. Um, and I'm looking at the efforts led by the government of Japan and Daiwa Securities, whose people I've met with a couple of times in Yangon. And I'm wondering, do you think that this is going to be a successful uh, stock exchange? Um, or will it be so much in a Japanese style with Japanese regulations and listing requirements and so forth that it will be not very open to the Sino Burmese entrepreneurs and f foreign entrepreneurs. What, in general, what are your thoughts about the possibilities of the new stock exchange? I have to be extremely careful of the subject because we're probably going to be the first and for the timing, the only company listed on the new <laughs> Yangon Stock Exchange. <laughs> so whatever I say, it's very, very uh, it's going to have some impact. Uh, so I have to be very careful. So here's the disclosure, OK? Um, the stock exchange of Yangon, which is earmarked to be opened by the third quarter of this year, uh, is a good start. It would be naive and a folly to think that it would be anywhere near what a stock market, a stock exchange should look like. It will not be.
but it's a good start. Without this start, we will not, never get to where it should get to. So from that angle, I think we welcome it. Okay. Um, in 1990, 1994, I think, when the first attempt for the stock exchange, the same with Daiwa Securities and Myanmar Economic Bank, and it's today called the Myanmar Securities Exchange was formed. We were also invited to list because we were, we were at that time the only public company um, in, in the country. And I remember uh, when they came to talk to me, I, I said, I only have one condition. So what is it? I said, I want the serial number 001. He said, good, you've got it. Then I asked, so who else is going to be listed? He said, no one else, only you. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, no, I don't want to be you know, middle of a circus, sort of everybody looking in and had absolutely no benefit. So we didn't list. And as a result, the stock exchange sort of, sort of just did it away for, for nearly 20 years. This time, they're serious doing it. And uh, we're qualified, so we, we said we would be. And it started with many companies. Well, as we grew closer to the date, I'm just told that we are probably, again, the only company. <laughs> and that bothers me, but it's too late. We're in, so we will be there. The difference today and then was that today they have some understanding of what needs, it needs to have a stock exchange. They have a true understanding of the importance of developing a capital market. Okay? And while the understanding is very uh, elementary, and that is not good because a lot of decisions that they'll make will not be good enough, but at least it's better than 15, 20 years ago when they just wanted something without refusing to even change the very basic laws to make it happen. You know? Today, they have a whole team. Baker McKenzie is on it, everybody is on it trying to pass, draft, and then pass all the laws that you would need to make that stock exchange viable. That's where we stand. Whether or not Chinese or Sino businessmen will be excluded, I do not think so. I do not think so. If you're qualified, you're, the trouble is the motive of particularly the Chinese ethnic businessmen in Myanmar just don't like to pay taxes. And if you don't pay taxes, you can't be listed. As simple as that. <laughs> so that's the situation. Please, back there. Hi, I'm Zoh from the Voice of America. Um, I have a two part question. Uh, my first question is, how do you become a, such a successful businessman without being branded as a crony? Because, you know, your contemporaries, some of the businessmen, they are being branded as a crony, but you are the only one, as far as I know, not being branded as a crony. My second question is, what would you do if the government offer you a cabinet position, oh. or the government position? <laughs> well, I'll answer the first one first. Because the first question has been a question that's been asked, and uh, it's asked so many times some with sincere sincerity, some sarcastically, some basically trying to prove a point. Let me just say this. When I went back in 1991 to start Search Pan and Associates, SPA, I set down a rule that there will be no bribes paid, there will be no under table. And it was not because I was very noble, let me be clear on that. I was just pragmatic. If you recall, and some of you will, I'm sure, that was a time when the South Korean president, Chun Doo Hwan, was arrested for corruption, made when he was president 15 years ago. He has since retired, and three administrations have passed, but then he was thrown in jail for the time when he was president 15 years ago. Because of his contribution to the democratization process of South Korea, the incumbent president pardoned him. 
and he came back out within a few days. The full chairman of the Chilbals that accompanied him into jail never came out. <laughs> and I said to myself, I don't want to be in that position 15 years after I retire for something I did 20 years ago. So that was a policy laid down. A lot of my associates, even my directors, said it would not be possible to be successful. And I said cheekily, I said, then we don't do it. I am here in Myanmar because the government has invited me to come and invest. I have five other offices. I need an office in Myanmar like I need a hole in my head. So if I'm going to do something like that, with the risk of something negative happening 15 years, 20 years down the road, why am I doing it? So if we have to pay to get a project, we don't do the project. Full stop, period. Right? The fact is that in the cabinet, there are basically three groups of people. The first, which I call them the Young Turks. Now I'm going back to 1991 and the early 90s. The Young Turks, patriotic, young, good people, good military people. Wants a country to move ahead after 28 years of Burmese period of socialism and in shambles. Second group, the big majority, senior cabinet ministers, senior generals, I mean, senior military people. They sit on the fence and they look at how the wind is blowing. They probably take a bribe if you give it to them but they don't, don't necessarily ask for it. A very small number of ministers, totally corrupt. You cannot get anything done unless you pay. And because of our policy, the first group became very close to us. And I had more than my share of projects without having to pay anyone because I performed. The middle group came to us when there's an important project that needs performance. Probably the sweetheart deals all went to their friends, not to us. And the third group never came near us, and we never went near them. And we live happily thereafter together. <laughs> so that is how we survived the first 10 years. Right? And we prospered. And that's why I keep saying it's a myth to say that you have to bribe somebody in Myanmar to do business. You don't have to. The trouble is, business people choose to, and then complain a lot. So whenever I hear a co-businessman complaining about, about having to bribe somebody, I actually get very angry. I said, you choose to do it, don't complain. Okay? I am sure that's not your face when you're talking to the minister. You are trying so hard to shove that money down his, down his pocket, and then now you complain. The trouble is that, when you decide not to pay, you have to also decide at the same time to take the consequences. And that is, you won't get the project. If you're willing to take that consequence, you have no problem. Okay? It's those businessmen who are desperate to get it and will get it by all means, and then they complain about corruption. And that is why today I'm on the... On the uh, a global agenda council of the WEF on anti-corruption. And we keep saying that. It's a buy and sell. You know, people buy, people sell. Both sides have to be responsible if you want to eradicate corruption. So that's to answer your first question. The second question about cabinet post, not a chance. Not in my consideration. Not interested. Back there, and you're next. Uh, I'm Kim also of working for Radio Free Asia Bombay Service. And uh, I, I just want to know that there's a, about the minimum wages now. Most of the majority of the company, they only want to pay one and a half dollar to up to two dollars per day. But uh, workers are demanding four to five dollars. What is your suggestion, please? The current law has got a minimum wage. Okay? Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's probably about 50 odd dollars a month. 
That's the minimum wage, all right? Which comes to a bit more than, you know, less than $2 a day. Okay. But, uh, and it's, in chats, it's 50,000 chats, I think. Um, but the point is that the actual expense that a company uh, spends is not that minimum wage. Because as you know in Myanmar, if you have a manufacturing plant with let's say 1,000 workers, you have to provide not only the lunch, but you have to provide transport. Because we have no public transport. For that 1,000 workers to get to work, if you don't have ferry service, they can't get to work. Right? So the expenses that the company actually have is more than the minimum wage. Now, of course, workers would like to have more. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I think it just, you know, what the market will bear. To me, I advocated that for us, at this juncture of time, it's the creation of jobs. Our, lo our slogan is that, let's create one million jobs. One million jobs sounds like a big figure. It's not. It's 1,000 factories, each employing 1,000 workers. You got a million. You go to southern China, you have 30,000 factories, each employing more than 2,000 workers, right? So in Myanmar, just get 1,000 factories going, each employing 1,000 workers, you got a million, a million jobs, okay? If you take conflict areas like uh, the current state, okay, the two million Myanmar workers across the border in Thailand working for less than what Thai law uh, dictates, right? Because they're refugees. They should all come back and work, but there's no job. So if you provide that opportunity, they want to come home, they could actually be better off. So at this moment, getting a job to me is a lot more important than asking for a higher minimum wage. Because the people who are asking for a higher minimum wage are the people who already have a job. But there's a multiple portion of people who hasn't got that job yet. Right? And we should not be distorted by looking at a small percentage who has a job and who wants higher and forget about the masses that has no job and should get up to have a job with a minimum wage. So that's my view. Here, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is James Michael. I'm a consultant. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, in the same vein as the question about the stock exchange. It seems to me that Myanmar is faced with uh, enormous pressure on its institutions, both in government, professional institutions, and organizations that render services to people. And as you look to bring more people into the society, as you seek to make a peace that will extend uh, to the areas uh, throughout the country, uh, you've talked about reforms that are legislative, but if you have a land reform law, but you don't have a land reform registry office in the community, the impact on the individual is, is not evident. And I wonder if you could share your perception of how Myanmar is doing, both in, in government and in the private sector and professional sectors, in responding to this enormous set of needs that are so prevalent in, in the country right now. Thank you. The short answer is that it's struggling. It's struggling to fill the gaps that you just described. The gap between what a legislation produces and the ability to really um, carry out that legislation. There is a capacity gap, and that's well recognized by government, by civic society, as well as by business. And we're all trying very hard, but we're all struggling, okay? I think that's, that's my view. Please. My name is uh, Luen Yen, <coughs> Luen Yen Chan. Uh, I work for VOA, Burmese Service. 
Uh, I have a question about uh, World Bank's loan, 100 million loans to the uh, Yoma Bank, uh, if I'm not wrong. Oh, to Yoma uh, Strategic, not y Yoma Bank. Uh, They're two different entities. Okay, uh, strategic. Uh, so that loan is going to focus on the small and medium entrepreneur, and I want to know more about what kind of small and medium uh, entrepreneur that you're going to focus okay. on. I think um, I, I'm glad you asked this. That allows me to clarify a few things. That obviously, I think you're just confused like everybody else. First of all, the $100 million loan is to Yoma Strategic Holdings Limited, which is a Singapore-listed company. And it's not given by World Bank. It's given by Asian Development, Asian Development Bank, ADB. Okay. The World Bank, on the other hand, under IFC, has given Yoma Bank another loan of 30 million that is to be used to fund SME loans. Okay? And SME is typical SME. Yoma Bank is committed to become an SME bank. And we are probably in the forefront of uh, pushing the envelope to, to the maximum because current legislation in financial institutions law ha is very restrictive to give loans to SMEs because by nature, our legislation, particularly governing financial institutions, is very conservative. So for instance, you have to have extremely high collateral value for your loans. We cannot give more, we do not give more than 50% of the value of your collateral, which is valued at at least 30% lower than market, as for sales value. So at the end of the day, the amount of loan you can get on your collateral is not much, okay? And by virtue of that, most banks are very secured. The, the collateral they hold, they hold is many times the loan value. But that causes a big problem with SMEs who first have no collateral or very little collateral, and secondly, if they have a very small value. So we're trying to push that envelope. And we have a very, um, very good, robust uh, risk assessment team that actually do not look at your collateral, but look at your business as well as your repayability um, to ascertain how much we will lend you. Okay? Uh, we have a totally different approach, not a pawn shop where you, you bring your collateral, I give you 50%, you go away, don't come back. A year later, you come and pay me back. If you don't pay me, I sell your collateral, I get my money back. That's very much a pawn shop mentality, which is the encouraged modus operandi for banks in the past. Today, Yoma Bank is trying to change that, and that's where IFC is supporting. Please, woman in the back. Hi, I'm Yanwe with the World Wildlife Fund in DC. Um, I was wondering if you talk about um, corporate social responsibility in Myanmar and perhaps your vision for that for the country. Thank you. CSR, we have a very uh, big um, team doing CSR because we took it upon ourselves that CSR is a very new subject in this country. Now, we have this great support from the government as well as many civic societies, including our UF, UMFCCI, which is our Federation of Industries and so forth. Because somehow today, CSR is the cash phrase that everything you do has to have a CSR element in it. But we also feel that CSR is not necessarily understood clearly. And where the confusion is for local uh, enterprises is CSR means donation, which defeats the whole essence of CSR. So we are trying to be um, a pioneer in a lot of these CSR activities. Like we have a lot of seminars that we do in the countryside about um, uh, responsible business, about compliance, about governance, about paying taxes, etc., uh, which we feel is what we really need. Okay. And then we have uh, projects, which basically is not really donating money, but actually more on the social enterprise elements 
of uh, making something sustainable. So we do have uh, a heavy emphasis on CSR, and we think it's very important. In, 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 in this respect, I would like to brag a little bit. You know, in Myanmar Strategic is the only Myanmar company listed outside of Myanmar or in any international stock exchange. It's listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange. And of the 100 largest companies listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange, this year, the rating of the best governed, the best companies in ranking on CSR compliance, corporate governance, we ranked number 18. That's very high. Last year, we were number 50. This year, we're ranked number 18. And that's ahead of many, many famous Singapore companies because we really take it as a responsibility. We're a member of the global UN Global Compact. I personally uh, am very much involved in the, the WEF uh, Global Agenda Councils, and we take it seriously. We hope it will have an effect on other companies in Myanmar. But there are a lot of companies that are already doing it. Kelly? Hi, I'm Kelly Curry from Project 2049. Um, there, I want to go back to politics. There's a group in Burmese political society that you haven't spoken very much about, but they play a pretty significant role in the politics of the country, and that's the military. Um, as to whether the NLD participates in the, in the upcoming elections, um, for more than a year now, it hasn't been the Article 59F about whether Aung San Suu Kyi will be able to run for president, but the ability of the 25% of seats held by the military <coughs> to block any amendment to the Constitution at all on any of the many non-democratic aspects of the 2008 Constitution, which was drafted by the military um, without real genuine public cons consultation or participation and ratified in a deeply flawed exercise. And if you look at this and the fact that there will be 25% of the seats in the upcoming election set aside to again be appointed by the military, the elections in 2015, regardless of how, quote, clean they are, will still be fundamentally flawed and unfair. So do you, I, I keep hearing the use of this phrase, free and fair, as a standard for these elections, but is it really even reasonable to use that as a standard and shouldn't we be trying, you know, coming up with maybe some different standards around these elections because they can't possibly be free and fair when you have 25% of the seats set aside. Okay, I got your question. I beg to differ with you on this issue. And not because I'm right or you're wrong or the other way around. It's only because you are looking at democracy with the understanding and view of a democracy that is 200 years old. And I'm looking at a democracy that is four years old. In 2010, when we had the first election, it was democracy zero years old. And 50 years before that, there was no democracy. So we talk about this 25%. I think there's a wide divide on the view of whether the 25% of the seats of parliament held by the military is good or bad. Democracy forces will instantly say, that's bad, that's not fair. But I'd like to ask a question. If you look at Indonesia, Indonesia went through the same route of having the military dominate politics for the first 10 years of its transition to democracy. And today, Indonesia's democracy, I think, is more successful than a lot of countries. Okay. So if you were to say, we, do we need a stabilizing force? Maybe we don't, maybe we do. But I think the chances of chaos without a stabilizing force is higher. And then the chances of democracy, real fair democracy, is higher when you are stable. So 
We have a lot of debate on this. To me, if we do not have one factor that will at least be a stabilizing force, we will have a situation where everybody is clamoring over their own self, selfish interest in the name of democracy. And at the end, you will really not have a united country. As a matter of fact, we have seen this so many times in other countries where there's no stabilizing force, and it goes in all directions. So the risk at that time was that, yes, it doesn't seem fair that the military gets 25% free ride, and they have so much influence. And at that time, while I was a, a rather skeptic on this, four years down the road, I'm less of a skeptic because I look at how the military behave in the last four years, and I think they have behaved well. And if they continue to behave well, I think it will be positive rather than negative. So if you say, because of this clause, that they are there for 25%, anything that results is unfair and not democratic and is no good, I beg to differ, okay? What is called good, I'm not sure what is really good, okay? I mean, business people are very scared of instability. Business people don't want to see factions fighting, fighting for whatever political aspirations or goal with no regard to the well-being of the people, people getting jobs, if business is not willing to invest, there'll be no jobs. No matter how good a politician you are, jobs are created by business. And business don't come if you are not stable. And therefore, there's a big debate on whether that 25% is totally negative or something that is a needed evil, if you want to call it that way with quotation marks, for the transition period. And I, for one, openly would say that I am of the latter opinion that we would like to see stability over the transition. Now, if in the last four years the military has been acting differently and throwing their weight around and, and, and uh, canceling a lot of things that the democratic government, civilian government is doing, I would probably have a different view. Uh, but that has not been the case. So I hope we can continue to remain indifferent on that. So I think we're basically finished, but I'll just ask Matt, do you have a short question? OK. Thank you, Matthew Pennington from Associated Press. Do you have a view on um, what US sanctions policy should be? At the moment, um, military companies can't, uh, sorry, US companies can't um, invest with military companies or with targeted uh, cronies, former officials. Do you think that's a positive or a negative? The US sanctions, when it was imposed, I think um, were not effective. But I don't think it was negative. It was the right political um, statement to make. Um, and it did have certain effects. But was it effective? No. Because the military government couldn't care less. Okay. The real victims of that sanction were the people. And I recall, because I lived next to an industrial estate, where in the 90s, we had about 3,000 garment factories right next to where I live. And I don't know how many thousands and thousands of workers. Because of, because of section, sanctions, I think 2% or 3% of those factories remain, and the rest all closed down, because their goods cannot be sold anywhere. Well. Those people just lost their jobs. You know. In one industrial estate, I remember the petition was 320,000 jobs gone. Nobody could save it. Right? So in that sense, the people were the real, they took the brunt of that, of the sanctions. The government, the military government, they couldn't care less. In fact, it allowed them to close the doors and really loot the country more than they could have if it was open. So in that sense, I'm not sure whether it was positive. 
Today, different scenario, different landscape. Is the sanction still needed? I don't think so. The sanction will just be more negative, more hurt, hurt the US interests as well as hurt democracy. Sanctions on armed deals, yes, I think it's necessary because you don't want to encourage that the government to go along those roads, and it's actually no good anyway. Okay? Um, but overall, I think the US should reach out. The US should reach out because I don't know if you believe this or not, the people of Myanmar actually look up to the US. The people of Myanmar, if you're talking people to people, if you survey 100 Burmese and ask them, do you have family members outside of Myanmar? And if the answer is yes, where are they? Chances are that 95 of, out of 100 are either in America, United Kingdom, or Europe, or Australia. Five will be in China. And that's why when they say China has got a lot of influence, I say it's not true because the people to people level it's with the West. The Myanmar people look up to the American people, look up to the American government, and you should reach out. And that encompasses with the military. If you believe that the military plays a very important role in Myanmar politics, then reaching out, neutralizing, reforming that mindset is a task that all Western nations, democratic nations, have as a responsibility that is going to go a long way towards our democratic process. Instead of saying, don't touch the military, treat them as something untouchable, unwelcome, I think that's not pragmatic. And that's actually quite like um, cutting your nose to spite yourself. Right? You should reach out. The military, likewise, I think, would love to be taken in as a partner. And from what I know, they are hardliners, but the vast majority of officers would love to be West Point graduates, but they never had a chance. You make them West Point graduates, you don't have to do much. The whole military will change color, right? So it's as easy as that, see? But if you take a different view of isolation, isolating them, you're just giving yourself trouble. I hope I answered your question. Not that you might agree. Serge, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you allowing us to uh, plumb your views and uh, perceptions of what's going on in, in Myanmar today. Uh, we'll be watching, I think a lot of people in this room are going to be watching from now till November. And maybe if you come back early next year, we'd like to hear what's going on uh, again. But so please join me in thanking Serge for coming down from New York to talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.